my body He touched my mind He saved me Just in time I'm gonna praise His name Each day He's just the same Come on and praise Him Look what the Lord has done Come on and praise Him Look what the Lord has done. One more time. Come on and praise Him. Come on and praise Him. Look what the Lord has done. Hey, hallelujah. Woo. <laughs> Glory. Praise God. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. 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 Oh, yes. I remember one time in Soperton, Georgia, I went into a little country store. I was pastoring in a little town called Vidalia, Georgia, where the Vidalia onions come from. I kept bad breath for two years while I was there. <laughs> I remember one time I stopped on a little road, dirt road, and there was a little country store there, and as I was going in the store, there was a guy coming out and he had a, a snake. Just as I was going in the door, he was coming out and I gave him plenty of room for that thing. I mean, he's a big snake. I hate snakes anyway. And I walked in and uh, I said to the man behind the counter, I said, good grief, did you see that snake? He said, oh, that thing ain't nothing. I said, what do you mean it ain't nothing? I said, man, that's a snake. He said, yeah, but what you don't know is he defanged that thing. He can't hurt nobody. I want to tell everybody here tonight something. Jesus defanged the devil. He can't hurt you. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. I want to tell you something. Because of this revival, there's a lot of God's people that's under satanic attack. A lot of our altar workers, our staff, our worship team, choir members, church members. A lot of you, the devil tried to hinder you from getting here. But I want to tell you, the devil's leveled his best shot at us, and we're still standing for the Lord. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So he may look vicious, folks, and he may look bad, and he may threaten, and he may bark, and he may howl. But you have nothing to fear. Jesus said, all power. He is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And he said, you shall tread upon serpents and scorpions, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Yes. Glory. Oh, yeah. I remember, you may be seated. I remember whenever I was a small boy in church, I saw the most romantic thing happen one Sunday night. I saw a man and his wife that had been divorced came to church on a Sunday night at Riverview Assembly of God in Columbus, Georgia. And they got saved. And I remember them standing before the church and they stood there and they hugged and they cried and they held one another and embraced for the longest. It seemed like 30 minutes. They just held each other and embraced and cried. And I remember the church just left their pew and came and just stood around them and the church cried with them. And I thought, man, that, that made such an indelible impression on my mind. I never forgot that. And I thought, boy, wouldn't it be neat one day to pastor a church and have something like that happen? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's happened. <clears throat> For those of you that don't know the story, I'm going to tell it to you real quick. We're about to have a wedding here in just a few moments. Charlie, I mean uh, Charlie, Steve and I was over in, in, in Mobile doing a live television program. And while we were doing the television program, Steve looked into the camera and he said, there's a pastor watching us right now. And he said, um, you live within two hours of this great revival in Pensacola. And he said, you need to obey God and you need to come because God's dealing with your heart. And if you don't come, you're going to miss out on a tremendous blessing of the Lord. 
And I remember, thank you, I remember that uh, when, he, when Steve looked in the camera and pointed his finger, I felt, I just felt a bolt of authority and the power of the Holy Spirit when he said it. Come to find out, <clears throat> the next Friday night, that was on Tuesday night, that happened on Friday night, we had a great service. That was a night that Robert came in and, and God did such a great work in his life from Atlanta. Stand up, Robert. Everybody knows who you are by now. This guy drives from Atlanta. <laughs> This guy and his wife and family drives from Atlanta every week now to be in these weekend services with us. God's done such a phenomenal work. When he came in, can I say it? Can I say it? This guy was a heathen, folks. I mean, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this guy was a heathen. God, God miraculously saved him. I remember I never walked off the platform before and walked back and talked to anybody like that during the break, just walked up to him. But I, I saw him and I walked right up to him. And uh, I talked to him for a few minutes, and I hugged him. And he said whenever I hugged him, he felt the devil go out the top of his head. <laughs> now I can see it now. There's going to be people lined up after the service. Would you hug my husband? <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was the night he got saved. We had a phenomenal Friday night that night. But anyway, at the altar call, when Steve gave the altar call that night, you know, you can't sit here. 180 services and, and see so many thousands of people come forward since Father's Day of last year And there's gonna be some things that'll stand out in your mind Well, I remember looking and when Steve gave the altar call the place just filled up There was probably four or five hundred people got saved that night here And I remember in the back of the line I, I was sitting there and I just looked up and I saw a sea of faces all across here But there was a woman that came down the aisle a young woman and I, I saw her say, and she was wringing her hands. She said, he's here somewhere. He's here. I know he's here. And she was just wringing her hands. And so she had such a look on her face that I was kind of, you know, joining in with her. I was looking, you know, where is he? Bless me. <laughs> I was looking over there. And about that time, I saw this man's head pop up over here. And he looked this way. And he was looking past the crowd like this. And they didn't even know one another was here. Now, this thing's been going on since Father's Day, June the 17th, 1995. We've had a lot of services. This was both of their first nights being here. And she's looking for him. And I looked over there, and I saw this black-headed guy. He's looking for somebody. And about that time, their eyes locked like that. And they went and embraced in the middle aisle, and I was having deja vu all over again, man. I mean, you know, it was just like they joined together in the aisle and they locked arms man and they hugged and they cried and come to find out whenever they did that i took the mic back there and went to interviewing them and i said man what in the world happened she said well this is our first night here and she said this is my husband and i just felt when i came to the altar he was here somewhere and she said i just knew he was i could feel him here and i looked over there and he was looking for her he could feel her presence here and they'd been divorced a year and a half and how many children you got three got th three children and come to find out, this guy was a music director at a church. And come to find out, when we was on that TV program that night, Steve and I in Mobile, and Steve pointed in the camera and said, there's a man that lives within two hours of here watching me on television. You need to come to this revival. That pastor came that Friday night, and that was this guy that they got back together that night. That was his pastor that he worked for. It was all their first night being here. And it just so happened that the cameraman that Steve looked at when he spoke into the camera, the cameraman that was operating that camera, this was his first night here. And this pastor down there was his pastor also. <laughs> a phenomenal story. To make a long story short, I just uh, went down there and counseled him. And I looked at him and I said, hey, buddy, you're going to marry her again. You hear me? <laughs> that was a counsel that I gave him. I said, you know, God's going to get you guys back together and y'all going to get married again and do it quick. Well, that was what? What day? What? Seven weeks to the day. And I want you to give a good Pensacola welcome. Now listen to this. These, these are wonderful, wonderful godly people. I want you to listen to their names. The pastor's name is Dan and his wife's name is Carolyn Rizzo. The couple that's getting back together is Tim Griffin and Fonda Mills. And it's going to be in just a moment. Fonda Griffin once again. Would you welcome them, please? Uh, 
Hallelujah. Come on up, folks. Come on up. We want everybody to see y'all. Come on up here. Yeah, come on up here. Y'all got a ready-made family, hadn't you? God bless you. God bless you, man. Good to see you. And who is this? Father. Now listen. It's the will of the Lord. This is the will of the Lord. You understand? She feels better now. Okay. She feels better. It's the will of the Lord, baby. Don't worry about it. And you're her mother? Okay. All right. The pastor, do your thing, man. I can't use that. I've got this on here. Well, first, I would like to thank you folks, especially uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob here. <laughs> That's the way I look at you folks. And I, I, personally, I want to thank you for providing the fire here. And we came with the fuel. Keep the fire going. There's a lot of lighter knots out there that need to be lit. When I first saw this man, I thought he was King David. I used to see him in visions. Man looked just like him. And I used to see King David dancing, and every time he danced, I danced. Four and a half hours, I got up off the floor, been to heaven six or seven times. Every time I see this man, he reminds me of King David. But he's still Abraham tonight. I got to thank you folks for being in an attitude of prayer, because that's what brought all this to pass. And then there's my earthly insurance man right down there, Jack. He invited me here last year, and uh, you were talking about we needed to come here. Well, I believe in God's timing. And until these two folks were ready, it wouldn't have made any difference if we come here anyway. So I thank God for his timing. And tonight we're going to do something. I have to read this because I don't want to make any mistakes. Okay. This, uh, this marriage is a marriage of reconciliation and it's indicative of what God is doing in the church because the church has kind of split off from him for the last 2,000 years and God is reconciling the church back to himself. Listen to it in Hosea 6. That man spoke of us today. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, and you know what Peter says about a day being a thousand years, two thousand years have passed, he will revive us. And on the third day, which we're fast approaching, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. And now, folks, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, and I feel free by the Holy Spirit to do this. Now that he has arrested our attention, it's imperative that we acknowledge the Lord and let us press on to maturity to know him, to be enraptured by him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains and like the spring rains, the latter rains that water the earth. That's God speaking about the soon coming of the king. Now, are you folks ready for this? Okay, we're gathered here in the, in the sight of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ and this congregation to re reunite these friends and <laughs> I consider them my children too. It's been a long time and it's been almost three years of intercession before during this operation and now the restoration of it so that you two guys could get back together again. And I thank God for this congregation again. I just can't thank you enough and for you folks and the prayer team here the intercessor prayer team and everybody involved in this that you made the forum possible for us to join in with you. You ready for this now? You're sure it is. Would you face me over here? Okay. Hi, buddy. Come over here. Honey, come over to my side, please. Before the fall, God designed marriage in the quiet of the Garden of Eden. Before evil had even touched anybody, God saw it was not good for a man to be alone, so he made a partner suitable for him. And you see, out of one, he made two so that the two could become one again. He established the right of marriage there. 
And uh, he ordained it to be the foundation of home life and social order and purpose that there was to be no separation. Do you remember Jesus saying, in the beginning it was not like this. But if there was, according to the New Testament, you were to remain unmarried or else be reconciled to one another. Thank God it's happened. In obedience to the Holy Spirit who has worked in these folks, that which is well-pleasing in his sight, he's prepared their hearts to receive conviction and tenderness of heart towards each other. He's accomplished his forgiveness towards each other. He's effected this reconciliation to God and to each other. And then he has rekindled the flame of God's love and repaired the breach in this broken marriage. And here is our lovely Holy Spirit doing all of this thing. He's restored relationships to God, to one another, and to the children again. And he's now renewing, strengthening, and reinforcing your vows to God. And it's given you the spirit of joy and rejoicing without measure. In light of this, Tim and Fonda, folks, now present themselves before Father God and our Lord and you folks to be married. Are you ready, sir? Now, this reunion is not chance and it's not circumstance, but as you heard from Pastor here, that it's design. And uh, most of us present here were aware of the orchestration and the synchronization that took place. And you know that only God could have brought this to pass. In this ceremony, we're going to be sharing in a moment in the lives of these people who know this to be God's will for their, for their lives. They're, they're just honored and pleased that you share with them. Now we come to the blessing of the parents. Would you folks approach these people, please? Preparatory work of the parents is ended. Did you hear that, folks? Your work is now over. It's been a long, hard fight. They've served the purpose of God as parents in teaching their children to become responsible as man and wife in their respective roles of life. And it's the time when parents willingly transfer the primary place they had in their lives and give their blessing to this marriage. Now, who blesses this woman with their son? Yo. Would you bless him, please? Now, who blesses this man with their daughter? I was looking around for appropriate words to uh, speak to this couple here, and the Lord took me to the Song of Solomon, and he allowed me to paraphrase some of this because I, I got into the root meaning of some of these words, and I'm going to tell you what they mean in this poem. My beloved spoke to me and said, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come away with me. I want you folks to understand, this is God talking to his church. And this is his church here in this is his beloved, these two folks here. The winter is past, the rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines with tender grapes spread their fra fragrance whispering, arise, come my darling, my beautiful one, come away with me. My dove who dwells in the cleft of the rock in the refuge and fortress of the Most High, show me your face let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your countenance is lovely. Come away with me. My beloved is mine and I am his. 
until that day dawns when the shadows flee, he says to you, turn, my beloved, come away, my beloved, come away with me. You like that. That's our God. Now, we're speaking about a marriage that is a covenant, and it's between two people who have agreed to become one, forming a new creation. The new covenant came into effect after the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So a marriage covenant comes into effect in a figure after the death of each party as an individual self-life who are then resurrected as one new creation, the two becoming one. And to the congregation, we're, we're talking about vows here. I would like you to think of this as a time of reevaluation, renewing, a reinforcing and a strengthening of your vows to God and each other. Whether our marriages are apart or separate, separated, this is just a reconciliation and a renewed sense of commitment. And I have to read to you what the Bible says about vows. It's very important that we understand this. Ecclesiastes 5.1. Be careful when you come into the presence of God to make a vow. Weigh your words carefully. Do not be rash in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. When you make a vow to God, do not de delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in foolishness. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your words lead you into sin. And do not pr protest to his messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? In the uttering of many words, there is meaningless foolishness. Therefore, stand in awesome respect of God. Now, in light of these words, are you ready to make your vows before God? Tim, I want you to turn to Fonda and repeat these words. Fonda, I do voluntarily promise to renounce my self-life. Plus to renounce. And to be reunited with you in spirit and truth. Now, Tim, face me, please. I'm going to ask you a question. Will you, Tim, Fonda, accept, accept Fonda to be your wife? Okay. Will you vow before God and these friends to be her faithful husband, her covering, to share with her in plenty and want, in joy and sorrow, to forgive her and strengthen her, to join with her, so that together you may serve God and others acceptably till Jesus comes? Okay. Fonda, turn to Tim and say this to him. I also promise to voluntarily renounce my self-life. Whatever. And be reminded with you, Tim, in spirit and truth. Now, will you, Fonda, accept Tim to be your husband and your covering? Is that man getting close to me again? <laughs> oh, folks, it's heavy up here. Lord, this is, some, this is some marriage, I'll tell you. We're going to make it through. Will you vow before God and these friends to be his faithful wife, to share with him in plenty and in want, in joy and sorrow, in intercession and to forgive and to strengthen him, to join with him so that together you may serve God and others acceptably till Jesus comes? Okay, in light of that, so we can offer communion to you because communion is for a people with a covenant relationship with God and with each other. It's a joining of one another with a common interest. Now, communion involves commitment and agreement and a contract. In Amos 3.3, 3, it says, Two cannot walk together except they are in agreement with one another. A marriage is, therefore, a covenantal communion between two people who have agreed to become one and communicating that one new life as an outward expression of that inward conviction. you know what to do with this. Okay. Him you offer. Tell her I offer you communion in anticipation of our one new life together.
Okay. You turn to Daddy and Mama, please. This way. Now we're ready to give them another seal, a token, a covenant of their relationship. This ring is a material uh, symbol designed to illustrate a spiritual truth. It has two characteristics I'd like to impart to you. It's a reminder of the importance of giving Christ first place in our relationship. First, the ring is a circle. Circles are not meant to be broken. They go on and on and on. And then Christian marriages should never end. Though difficult times will come, the commitment of Christians is to draw strength from each other through Christ who promised to keep pouring his strength into them. And this ring is a reminder of that never-ending commitment. You hear this? Second, the rings are made from precious metal, usually silver or gold, which has the unusual quality of getting better and more valuable with age. Our prayer for you is that you may value your love and make it grow exceedingly more abundant and always improving with time. Now, this is an outward sign of your covenant together. It reminds each of you and signifies to all others that you have entered into a life relationship with each other. Now, with these characteristics in mind, I ask you to exchange rings with one another. Repeat this, please, Fonda. I give this ring to you as a sign of my Christian commitment and covenant relationship to you in marriage. Same thing. Okay. Now, in the word, we understand that God is love. Therefore, love is God expressed. And when you realize this, you'll be able to do this. It's in Ephesians in case you want to look it up sometime and renew your marriage vows to one another. You always give thanks to God our Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may be able to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And as a wife, you may submit to your husband as to the Lord, knowing that Christ has placed the husband as the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church's body of which he is the Savior. Now as the sh church submits to Christ, so also wives may submit to their husbands and everything. And as a husband, you're able to love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the water, washing of the water with the word, and to present her to himself, a radiant church, a radiant bride, without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands are able to love their wives as their own bodies, for we are members of his body, and then Paul goes on to say, this is a deep mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. Now that you've made your vows, I have a blessing that God gave me especially for you, and it's to the church too, but I took it out of context, if you will, and I'm going to give it to you in light of what has happened to you, what has come against you, and what God says about the whole thing. You raise your right hand, please. Do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. You will not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker, the Lord Almighty, is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of all the earth. He has called you back from being forsaken and grieved in spirit, who married young and suffered rejection, says your God. For a brief moment he abandoned you, but with deep compassion he has brought you back. He hid his face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, he will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Isn't that great? That's our God. Listen, to me, this is like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We're not through. There's more. <laughs> to me, this is like the days of Noah, when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you and never to rebuke you again. And he's speaking of the end times. Listen, when everything comes crashing down, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace 
be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Your son will be taught of the Lord, and great will be your children's peace. You be, will be established in righteousness. Tyranny will be far from you. You will have nothing to fear. Terror will be far removed. It will not come near you. If anyone does attack you, it will not be the Lord's doing. Whoever attacks you will fall for your sake. No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute. You will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is his vindication of them, declares the Lord. Now, God, would you lay hands on her, please? I need somebody to lean on here for a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay with you. God, make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. This is my personal blessing to you because I, I know you folks deeply. The Lord fill you with the knowledge of his will, work in you the power to will and to do for his good pleasure. Make your calling and election sure. Prepare you for his soon return to earth. Crown you with glory to overcome and reign with him on the earth. Give you a grand entrance into the everlasting kingdom of God to stand in his presence with singing and great joy forever. Hey, yes. Thank you, Father. Oh, Lord. Okay, buddy, this is it. In light of what you have just heard and said, I pronounce you husband and wife this day, Friday, March the 1st, 1996. In the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> bless you, brother. Oh, bless you. Yeah. Let you sit still. Hurry, get in that fast. Take that, devil. I'll tell you what. My God. I'll tell you what. Wait a minute it's before you leave. Yeah, let's do Jesus. something special. Thank you, Lord. Let's Thank do something you. special. I want every man. Thank you, Father. And every woman that's husband and wife. Wait a minute, don't leave, Pastor. I want every man and wife Something in the building. If you're not together, here. go get together right now. I want every man and wife. To, we're going to kiss here in just a minute. March 1st. It's a leap year. We're going to kiss tonight. I want every man and his wife to get together right quick. And I want you to say to us too, Pastor, I want you to say you may kiss your bride when everybody gets together, okay? I'll tell you what. Let's let, let's let him do it. Yeah, that's yeah, come better, here. yeah. Come here. This is the biggest kiss in yeah. creation. <laughs> All right. Is every husband and wife together? Yeah. <laughs> hey, come here. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> hey. My baby looks like a bride tonight. Look at that lace. <laughs> we didn't know we was going to do this, did we? Yeah. So... Come on, Mom. Okay, brother, I want you to say to everybody, husbands, you may kiss your bride. And you want, you want to say anything before you say that? <laughs> Appreciate all your prayers. We need them. And we may kiss our brides. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. 
a song of celebration. Lift up a shout of praise for the bridegroom will come. The glorious one. Much better place Dance with all your might Lift up your hands And clap for joy For the time's drawing near He will appear And oh We will stand by his side A star, your spotless bride, and we will dance on the streets that are cold. Glorious bride and the great son of man. Every tongue and tribe and nation will join in the song of. the song of the land. Dance with all your might. Lift up your hands and clap for joy for the times drawing near. He will appear and oh Stand by his side. The sun, your spotless bride. And we will dance on the streets that are golden. Glorious bride and the great son of man. Glorious bride and the great son of man. Every tongue and tribe and nation will join in the song of the land. Sing aloud for the time of rejoicing is here. soon to appear oh yeah oh the wedding feast is now come it's near at hand lift up your voice proclaim the coming land and we will dance on the streets that are the song of the land. Oh. oh, we will dance on the streets that are golden, the glorious bride and the great son of man. Every tongue and tribe and nation will join in the song Street. 
song of the land. Sing aloud. Sing aloud for the time of rejoicing is here. The risen King, our groom, is soon to the appear. King, the wedding feast to come is now at hand. Come on, lift up your voice, proclaim the coming. Like 
not fear Your love is here to comfort me Yes, it is Many sorrows cannot quench your love And darkness cannot overwhelm it I will not fear your love is here to comfort me, to comfort me. When I find you, I find peace And I know that there's no river so wide No mountain so high No ocean so deep That you can't part the sea tonight. Do you really love him? Yeah. Holy, holy Lord. Not only do you love the Lord, but do you love one another? Yeah. I want to show you something. Watch this. The, the amazing thing about this revival is it's bringing people from all walks of life under this roof. This is not a Brownsville revival. This is a Pensacola revival. God's bringing people of all faiths and all denominations under this roof. Watch this. How many Baptists do we have here tonight? Look at this. Look, look, all over. Up in the back. Wow. Where are y'all from? All from Georgia? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I heard a New York accent there, though, didn't I? <laughs> How many Methodist folks do we have here tonight? <laughs> How many Presbyterian people do we have? All right, Presbyterian. How many Episcopal people do we have with us? Wow, all right. How about Catholic? All right, great. How many Charismatic and Pentecostal people do we have here tonight? Richard, I want you to do the same thing here right quick. How many of you are from outside the Southeast United States? Now, I know that we have a lot of us here that are from the Southeast. Let me see your hand. You're from the Southeast United States, all right? How many of you are not from within the Southeast United States? You live outside the Southeast United States. Good. Where are y'all from? Iowa. Wow. Keep them up. Keep them up just for a moment. Where are y'all from? Pennsylvania? Wow. What part? Gettysburg. Right? Back here in the back, where are you from, sir? Saudi Arabia. Go 
Brother, now you talk about oil. We got some oil here that'll knock that oil off his socks. Amen. All right. What about the rest of y'all? Where are you from? Back here in the back. British Columbia, Canada. Wow. Amanda. Outside the Southeast United States. Let me see your hand again. All right. Uh, where y'all from back there? Pennsylvania, wonderful. Great. Over here. Where are you from? New York? Back in the back? Just, just for a moment, hold your applause until we get through it all. Back there in the back, where are you from? Yes, sir. New Jersey? All right. Hold your hand up outside the Southeast United States. Where are you from? Atlanta. Where? Havana? Where are you from? Yes, ma'am. Chicago. Chicago. All right. Over here. Colorado. All right. Over here. Ohio. Hawaii. All right. Up in the balcony. Where y'all from? Up in the balcony. I see us myself from hands up. Hawaii. Do y'all know each other? large and by the time they did surgery they did a biopsy first and found out it was malignant this was in January and on February 2nd she had surgery 
and it was they were just supposed to cut the neck open right here and take the tumor out. And when they before they went into surgery, the doctor met with her and told her that they may have to do radical surgery. And she told me right before she asked her boys to go out of the room, she said, you've got to take care of my boys and help them get through this. And I said, well, you know, I always help. I'll be there. But uh, she told me they may have to do radical surgery. And I said, what in the world is that? And she said, well, they may have to saw me open and split me apart to get the tumor out if it's worse than they think. And she said, please ask all the people in the waiting room, the preachers, to pray that they don't have to do that radical surgery. And uh, we had come over here on Thursday night before she had surgery on Friday. And Brother Kilpatrick and everyone prayed for her here. And we had everybody in the United States praying for her. All the churches, Assembly of God and everybody, Baptist, Methodist, everybody. And um, the doctor came out in the middle of the surgery, one of the nurses came out, male nurses, and told us that the doctor was having to start the radical surgery. So we were very, very upset. We were hoping she wouldn't have to go through that. But um, he started it, and the surgery lasted six and a half hours at Baptist Hospital on February 2nd. And after surgery, he came out and told us that it was much, much worse than they'd ever dreamed. The tumor was five times the size they thought and they had to saw her open and split her apart and they usually take out all the bottom teeth but he tried to do it with just taking one tooth out and they had to put her back together with a metal plate and screws and he told us how devastating the news was for her that they had to take out two-thirds of her tongue and they had to reconstruct the tongue. They were supposed to take muscle off the chest, but they decided to take tissue out of the throat and rebuild the tongue. And he told us that she would never be able to talk properly. She would have to have months and months of speech therapy and that she probably wouldn't speak for a while and she'd have to learn to talk all over like a baby. And then after months and months of speech therapy, she would never talk properly again, that she would have speech impediment. And what happened? <laughs> oh, one other thing, she wouldn't be able to swallow, and she'd probably have to have a stomach tube the rest of her life. But six days after surgery, well, seven actually, she was speaking and... You probably, you probably won't be able to understand her, but we're going to try to help her talk here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I want, you to, I want you to listen to this. I want you to listen to this. Listen to how good she's talking. I praise God tonight for everything he's done for me. <laughs> he ha he's done it all. <laughs> uh, the doctors are amazed. I'm a miracle. <laughs> so you're, you're not supposed to be eating, you, you, you're not supposed to be swallowing, and you're not supposed to be talking? Oxygen and a trach. And I'm supposed to have a feeding tube. <laughs> but you know what? I remember. Go ahead. Uh, when I spoke, I'm still having a little bit of problem, but the speech therapist said, you don't need me. But uh, the doctor came in to put in a new trach, and this was six days after surgery. And uh, he said, you know, Marilyn, I'm going to hold that hole in your throat there for a little bit. And he said, I want you to see if you could breathe. And so uh, he held it over, and he said, now, can you breathe out of your nose? And I breathed a couple of times, and I said, yes, I can. And it was like the nurse said, well, who said that? Yeah. <laughs> wow. And 
and he said, say something else. And I said, Dr. Pennington, he's my doctor. <laughs> and he looked at me and he just grinned from ear to ear and he said, well, you don't need that trach. Can you throw it over to the side? <laughs> And the next day, he tested me on um, liquids, and everybody fails because they throw up. They gag. I swallowed everything. They started taking it away, and I said, wait, I'm hungry. <laughs> Don't take that away. <laughs> when we left, she was still eating. <laughs> and so, uh, one of my favorite pastimes, but um, he just said, he just pulled that stomach tube out and threw it in the garbage can. He said, you don't need that. And it was, in se it was seven days. God works in sevens. Yes, he does. <laughs> yeah. 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 Dr. Kilpatrick told me the night before my surgery that I was going to be one of God's miracles when he prayed for me. I remember whenever we prayed for her that night, it wasn't, wasn't our prayers or anything to do with us, but before we prayed for her, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. And, and I know how serious cancer is, and I know how debilitating it can be and how deforming. But before I prayed for her, I looked at her and I said, the Holy Spirit wanted me to tell you that you're going to be a miracle. I prayed for you right back over there, didn't I? Wasn't it right back in this area, right back in here? But the Holy Spirit said that you was going to be a miracle. And I'm going to tell you, you are a miracle. And you know something? You know something? The thing I love about it is you have an identical twin sister, so the devil's got a double barrel of trouble. <laughs> God bless you. Uh, we've always sang together, and I told my doctor today I was going to sing again. <laughs> All right. We'll have you sing one night in a revival. How's that? Okay? God bless you. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. This is my old buddy, Chaplain Robertson. We've had, I don't know how many people come in here and say, Brother Kilpatrick, can you come preach for us? And Brother Steve, will you come preach for us? And Brother Steve and I have just taken very, very little, you know, if any, outside engagements because, you know, being here so many nights a week takes so much of our energy, and we're trying to pastor also. And uh, Brother Steve, of course, he's so busy every night, and he's just worn out. And uh, they said, well, do you know of anybody you can send? I said, well, yeah, we've got some people we can send. One of them is Chaplain Kerry Robertson. And I said, wherever he goes, he'll do a good job. And he represents this church and pastor real well. He's a seasoned pastor, man of God for years. And um, he could be about anything in the kingdom of God he wanted to be. So a pastor asked me, he said, can you come to Atlanta to a Baptist church up there and, and preach? And I said, man, I'd love to, but I just can't. I said, but I'll send Chaplain Robertson. And uh, come on up here, brother, and tell him what happened. Tell them who you are and tell them what happened. I'm Bob Shadows, pastor of Friendship Baptist Church in, uh, well, fi about 15 miles out of Atlanta, out of downtown Atlanta. And I'd been going through some pretty hard times, like a lot of Baptists do, you know. And, and uh, <laughs> had, a, had a, an associate that he said God told him to start a church, and I th he thought God wanted him to start one out of my church. So it started a whole lot of trouble and, and problems, and I was really down, almost ready to quit. And I was hungry and thirsty, and I came down here, and God knocked me out right there. I was, I was out cold. And the Holy Spirit said, uh, sit up. The pastor has a word for you. And, and you know, I sat up, but I, I knew the pastor couldn't have a word for me because there was people all around me. I mean, it was just jammed full there. And I sat up, and an usher came down and said, could you come up? The pastor's got a word for you. <laughs> and I came up, and, and Brother John, uh, he said, Brother, the Lord wants me to tell you this, that sometimes God will put like a lightning rod right in the middle of your church and draw everything that's flaky to it and then snatch it out so you can have revival. And... Uh, <laughs> So God snatched it out, and uh, I said, well, we're ready to have revival. And, and you know, I knew, I knew God sent me down here for a reason. So I, I lit in on Brother John and, and Brother Steve, and uh, I got to, you know, uh, it'll be maybe, maybe in 15, 20 years, you know, we might can come and preach. 
And they sent me to Carrie, and Carrie and I just really locked in pretty close. And Carrie started last Sunday morning. We went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. Now, we see uh, at without putting out chairs and things, about 600 people, and we were, we were full uh, each service. But uh, what's happening here is, is happening there. Uh, <laughs> amen. If uh, Sunday morning through Wednesday night, we had uh, 107 people saved and 1,400 other decisions where people was coming back to the Lord. And God is using this man. <laughs> He's my brother. So I thought, you know, well, I like that so much that I, I got with Brother John today and, and I told him, I, you know, I'm sort of a man without a country, you know, a charismatic Baptist with a charismatic Baptist church. And uh, <laughs> I said, Brother John, would you and Browns will be our covering in this revival since it did start here, this first place it hit in the United States. And Brother John said we would be extremely happy to do so. So uh, Southern Baptist Church is now covered by Brownsville Assembly of God, and we thank you. Bob didn't tell you is that about half of his church, one of his churches, he has two up there on the East and West Campus. You folks from Friendship, stand up. Uh, these, there's some of them down here. Praise God. Praise God. There's a girl standing over there that uh, on Tuesday night was saved and delivered from crack cocaine. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to receive an offering in just a moment. And yes. 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 God loves a hilarious giver. Amen. Praise God. But he will take money from a grouch, too. I'm going to receive an offering in just a moment. And. So, Lord, I'm going to ask you now to speak to people's hearts and lives, and uh, I'll say more about that offering in just a moment, but the Holy Spirit's going to begin to speak to people right now. But I want to tell you another thing that happened just last night, and I'm going to do this real quickly, but I, I just feel like it would be such a blessing. Uh, my oldest son is here, and uh, he has a, a friend of many years, two friends of many years from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And one of those friends came down here, was touched in the revival last weekend, and he went back uh, this week, and yesterday, he kidnapped this other friend of theirs and brought him down here, supposedly, to a, a concert. Now, he didn't, um, he didn't tell him what kind of concert it was. You have to know that this guy that was kidnapped was the largest drug dealer in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And, uh, of course, uh, this, this fellow said, well, Phil's going to be there. That's my son. And so uh, these guys had partied together, so this drug dealer felt like, well, Phil was going to be there and David was going to be there. It was going to be a ball. It was a concert, you know. So uh, he didn't question too much about it. And they came down, went to the Civic Center, couldn't get in Carmen concert. And so David said, uh, well, he said, this guy said, what are we going to do, David? And David said, well, said, we'll figure something out. And David slipped a tape in with Steve's testimony on it. And uh, he, he started making his way here to Brownsville. Uh, Shag, the, the drug dealer, didn't know what was going on. But he was listening to Steve's testimony and he said, I like that guy. So David pulls up in front of the church out here in, in just a little bit, and he says, the guy you, just, just, you were just listening to on the tape is speaking right inside there. Get out. I'm going to park the car. So Shag got out and came in here, came in here, and last night the altar call was given, and my son Philip brought Shag down here, and he was saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. God. 
God. Now, there's a sad side to that tale because there are a lot of addicts in Hattiesburg, Mississippi that are suffering withdrawal today because their sores dried up last night. I'm going to tell you, folks, I've been saved 41 years, and I've been preaching most of those 41 years, and this is the most exciting time I've ever experienced in my life in the kingdom of God. What a time to be alive. My God, we don't know how fortunate we are to be a part of what's going on. I used to read about Azusa Street, and I thought, Lord, if I could just be in that place, if I could just hear Brother Seymour, if I could just have him pray for me. Last night, I was praying for folks back there in, the, in one of the aisles, and I, and, and I just said, Lord, I'm just so dry and empty from, from this week of revival up in, in Atlanta. And I took my tag off, put it in the pocket, and came down here and stood. And Steve and I connected here in about eight feet of space. There was a bolt of light and went between us. And I'm telling you, God tacked me and filled me up again. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh. This is exciting, folks. It's exciting. God's doing some great things. Listen, God can do anything. He can do anything. Oh, man, I'm telling you. Well, God is speaking to your hearts. Tonight, this offering is going to our brother Steve Hill, our evangelist. And you in the chapel, God's speaking to you as well over there. Uh, we only take one offering a week for our evangelist. And, uh, and that's at his, insist his insistence. Uh, he wanted the other offerings that are taken the other nights of the, the meeting to go toward the expenses. And the expenses of the revival are considerable. But... Um, uh, he, he said, I'll just take the Friday night offering. And so this offering tonight is going to, to uh, Brother Steve. And many of you that are familiar uh, with the revival, you know that uh, he has a lot of responsibility upon him worldwide. Um, he gives most of what he gets away. And uh, so all of this money that you're going to give tonight is not going to him personally. It's going to ministries that he supports around the world. And uh, I'm going to tell you, I, I've never met a man in all my 41 years of being a Christian and almost all of those of being a preacher, I've never met a man that was more selfless uh, than, than Steve Hill in the ministry. I'm telling you, this guy has a heart like God. He's a giver. He is a giver just like God is a giver. And so I want you to give good tonight. I want you to give good tonight. I want you to give to God. It'll be given to Steve, but give to God, and uh, then you won't be disappointed. Ever, you won't ever be disappointed if you give to God. God's going to bless this offering tonight. I just feel like that God's going to do something special in, in this offering tonight. And so, yes, sir. Okay. You want to? Yes. Tonight, we could really use some substantial gifts for Brother Hill. There's some of you here that the Lord has blessed you to the point that it wouldn't be a problem for you to give $100 in this offering. It wouldn't be a problem for you at all. And some of you, it wouldn't be a problem to give 1000 But uh, we do need some substantial offering tonight to help Brother Hill. Over in the chapel, would you please hear us, hear a heart? I don't know of any other place in the world that you could go to right now, any other place on this planet, except maybe a major crusade somewhere overseas where you would see this many souls come to the Lord. I don't know of another church. I've never seen this many people come forward in church services ever in the United States. So if you want to make an investment in the kingdom of God and in souls, Ladies and gentlemen, we could sure use your gift tonight to help us, so please help us. This is fertile ground, and whatever you sow into this ground, I promise you it will return to you many, many times. We don't want you to give your, your tithe in this offering tonight. If you're a member of another church someplace else, your tithe belongs there, so uh, please don't, don't put your tithe in here. Uh, that would defeat everything God does. If, if we were to disobey him in that way. So we, we just want your offering tonight, just your offering. And as Pastor said, the needs are, are great. And so if God's speaking to your heart, and I believe God is, I just have an assurance in my heart that God is speaking to some people about some significant amounts to give in this offering tonight. So ushers, if you will, please come forward. And the offertory tonight is going to be uh, given by uh, Melanie Ward. And uh, so we, we thank God for her and for her her gifts and talents that God has blessed her with. She's going to minister to you as you give tonight. Would you bow your heads with me, please, as we pray? Father, we just rejoice in you tonight for what you're doing in the kingdom of God. And Lord, we thank you for these souls that you're bringing into the kingdom, Lord. 
The kingdom is enlarged and souls are coming in by the literal hundreds and thousands. And we're so grateful that our eyes are seeing these things and our ears are hearing reports like this healing testimony tonight and these miraculous salvations. And Lord, we just rejoice tonight in you. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for sending Steve Hill to this church, Lord God, and for this gracious church for opening its heart to the message and the move of the Spirit of God. And now because of that, uh, 16, 17,000 people have been ushered into the kingdom of God, not counting those that have been brought in outside of this building here. And Lord, we just praise you for what you're doing. And now it comes time for us, Lord, to support this great work with our financial means. And so we ask that you would help your people now to have open uh, hearts to give, hearts of love, hearts of graciousness and thanksgiving to give in this offering tonight that this tremendous need might be met to your kingdom's glory. Lord, receive a great victory now as your people worship you in their giving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
How many of you has ever seen the Allison tape? The Allison Ward tape? How many of you seen it? Hold your hand up. This is Allison's mother. I want her to take just a moment before we move on to the service and our worship. I want you to take just a moment and tell how the Lord has changed your family in this revival. What, to see your girls shaken mightily under the power of God like that, what do you think about that when you see that? You know, that, that tape is touching this nation. Churches are seeing it. and We heard of a church the other day in, in Florida. A church runs about 3,000 3, people. They showed that on Sunday morning. And the people were out of their seats in the aisles and the floor weeping. The pastor had fell over the pulpit and couldn't get up for a whole hour by just watching that tape. What do you think about that when you see things like that? I'm just totally in awe of the grace and the mercy of God. It's just but for His grace. It's just His grace and His mercy that He has seen fit to to save my children and to turn our lives totally toward him, totally toward him. And it's just because of his strength and his mercy and his grace that we're here and that, that he has the anointing on that plastic. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I've known the wards for a long time and I've always admired Melanie because, you know, being a single parent, it's hard, especially when you have three girls. Are they here? Stand up. There's Elizabeth and Allison. Stand up, girls. Elizabeth and Allison. Yeah, where's Abby? Oh, she's coming later. This is her daughters. And whenever you're a, you're a school teacher and, and you're trying to support a family, it, it's very difficult, especially whenever your girls are teenagers. But I've admired her for a long time, how that she's held the rein and kept her kids in church, and now God's blessed her and rewarded her. And I believe that the best is yet to come, honey. God bless you. Wonderful job. Thank you. I want to encourage everybody here to stay after the altar call. In just a few moments, Brother Hill is going to come and bring a message. It's going to be wonderful. I've been hearing him preach now for about 180-something times. And I told him the other day his preaching is getting better and better and better. From, Go ahead. From day one, his preaching has always been good, and I've always loved Steve. We've always been very dear friends. We used to talk about, he'd call me from Argentina, what God was doing in Argentina, and he'd say, John, you wouldn't believe it. He was thousands of miles away down there on that soil talking to me. Me and him would cry and weep over the telephone about what God was doing, how revival was moving, and I used to say, God, I wish I could be there, man, what God's doing. And then the Lord brought him here, and we're having a revival just that mighty right here in Pensacola. And that's wonderful. Listen, I want to encourage everybody, after he gives the altar call here in just a little bit, there'll be hundreds of people come to the Lord tonight, just on Friday nights and Saturday nights now, here in this church and in the chapel across the street. There's about 1,000 people who gives their lives to the Lord every Friday and Saturday night alone. That's not counting Wednesday, Thursday, and that's not counting those nights. It's not counting Sunday morning, but just those nights, there's about a thousand people give their life to the Lord. But after he gives the altar call for the sinners, one of the greatest blessings that's taking place with the Christians is God is refreshing the Christians. And I'd just like to ask you, how many of you have been in this revival? Has God refreshed you? Let me see your hand. Has he touched you at these altars? It's been remarkable. You know, today my wife and I was over at a restaurant eating lunch, and there was a bus out in the parking lot. When we walked in, where's the group today that I met from over there? And There you are. God bless you, man. Where's the pastor? There you are. God bless you, man. We was over in a restaurant eating. Just something about Morrison's. Me and, that's where we broke down and cried before over there in Morrison's. But this was the other Morrison's over in the Cordova Mall, and I was going through the line. This preacher came up to me and said, Hey, Brother Kilpatrick, I was at your pastor's conference, and he said, I brought a whole busload here tonight for the revival. And I went over there and sat down, and me and Brenda got to talking about it just a little bit later, and we looked out there and saw that bus in the parking lot, and she and I both broke down and just cried, Marsons, that God has sent revival to Pensacola. He just happened to send it to this church, but it so touches our hearts, it humbles us that God is moving like he's moving here in this church, 
and to see people come and to be touched by God. And we sat there and they loaded up on the bus and we saw the people as they were walking from the restaurant to the bus. And as they were moving toward the bus, you could see on their little faces anticipation. He said they were leaving and they were going to be here about 3 o'clock to come in and get a good seat. <clears throat> they were going to try to be in the sanctuary about 3 o'clock and sit here till 7 at church time. And me and Brenda watched those people moving toward that bus with anticipation on their little faces that God would touch them and minister to them tonight. And I just speak a blessing over all of you that have come and over all of you that have come from outside the Pensacola area and you've driven and you've flown in. I speak a blessing over you here and in the chapel across the street that the Holy Ghost will just rain down on you tonight and bless you and refresh you and strengthen you with the power of His might. And may tonight be a life-changing night in your life and may you never be the same. And as you leave this place, may you take with you what you receive here and may it begin to grow and glow in your life from tonight forward in Jesus' name. But folks, let me just say this before we move on. Don't fail to come forward and get prayer. We've seen people that's come forward and they've driven for long distances and flown in and would stand around and watch and not get in and get prayer. I talked to one man the other night from Washington, D.C. It was a pastor and his wife. And he said, man, when I read your book, and he said, when I read in Charisma what God is doing in Pensacola, he said, a fire jumped up in my belly, and I got such an intense hunger to be touched by God. He said, Pastor, I kid you not, I would have ridden a bicycle to Pensacola to be touched by God. So folks, get in. Stand up with us. The worship team is coming back. Brother Lyndall Cooley is in Israel, and while he's gone, we thank God for the Coleman's leading us in worship. Thank you. I appreciate my church who uh, joined with us this past Wednesday night, and several of our people came over, and some stayed there and held the camp down as we ministered to uh, Royal Rangers and Missionettes and all the youth programs over there. But uh, a lot of our folks came over here and are back with us tonight. And I appreciate uh, our church, Holly Assembly of God, for being a part of this revival and what God is doing. Brother Pil Kilpatrick been blessed all summer. When we <clears throat> church is supposed to go down in the summer, ours kept going up because God blessed because of what he's doing here at Brownsville Assembly of God. And <clears throat> there is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do I could search for all eternity long And find there is none like you There is none like you No can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. I want to hear all the ladies sing now. Ladies sing now. Just the guys now. Sing to the Lord, fellas. There is none like you. Nobody, Jesus. No one else can touch my heart like you do. Nobody, Lord. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. Everybody say.
that again, but I'd like to say something to those of you that are in this main sanctuary and in the chapel. Those of you in the chapel, I want you to know that you're here under divine appointment. God's brought you here tonight, and you may think, well, I, you know, I came late, and I wanted to be in the main sanctuary. No. You're right on time. You're where you're supposed to be. God's brought you here, friend. That's the most important thing. But I, I want to say something to those of you that just feel so unholy. Okay, you just feel, you feel dirty inside. Friends, that's what Jesus is all about. He came for the sick. He came for the hurting. He came for you, man. But you don't know what I've done. He does. I promise you, he does. You're listening to a preacher, man. I've been drugged through the mud. And I've drugged everybody else through the mud. I was, when I came to the Lord, I didn't deserve anything. When he came down and touched me, I didn't deserve a thing. I deserved to die. And many of you can relate to that. You deserve death, man. But he loved me. He cared for me. And those, for those of you that are listening, that, that uh, are, are feel, you feel so unholy. You feel so dirty. I've got good news for you. Jesus is here. He loves you. He can wash you clean tonight. He, he's going to look at you, friend. He's going to look at you tonight. He's brought you here. Let's sing that one more time. Oh, how I love Jesus. And then we're going to sing it at that verse. We're going to sing to him, to me, you are so wonderful. And for those of you that feel that you're just not in that place where you can sing it, I want you to sing that anyway to him. To me, you are so wonderful. Sing it like that in anticipation for what he's going to do. Christians, those of you that are dry, look at me, man. You know what God's going to do tonight? He's going to soak you, man. I mean, he's going to soak you. And people come to this service. They come to this service, and I have them look at me night after night. See, this has been going on a long time. First time visitors, we've been here since Father's Day. We've had over a half a million people come through here. There is a pattern, okay? <laughs> Something's happening here. And you people come to this place. They'll fly in from Seattle, Washington. They come from Hawaii, they come from New Zealand, they come from all over the world, and they will stand here. One man said to me, I have come from Australia, and I am not leaving this place without God touching me. And I looked at him, I said, in just a few minutes, he's gonna. And he looked at me like, how do you know? <laughs> Friends, we just know. If your heart is after God, he's gonna touch you tonight. He's gonna kiss you. That's what he's doing here. That's what he's up to. Pastors, you don't put up a sign out front and say revival and keep it going for 185 services in a row, friend. It's because God showed up. He is showing up in this place. So Christians, you're going to sing this to me, you are so wonderful. And you may be dry as desert sand right now as you're singing this, but you're singing it because of what he's about to do. Oh, how I love.
tonight that we've been praying since Father's Day. And forgive me, those of you that are that are so theologically intact, I just, friend, I'm a simple man in touch with a powerful God. For those of you that want to know about the greatest evangelists that lived in this world, most of them were simple men. You read their messages and you just shake your head. You read, you read George Whitfield's messages. You go, dear God, man. You go down to Argentina and listen to Carlos Anaconda that's led two million people to Jesus. His message, every one of them are, Jesus loves you, has a plan for your life, won't you come? And he's led over two million people to the Lord. I mean, friend. So we pray every night, dear Jesus, speak to my heart, change my life. Simple. That's enough. Sometimes fewer words, friends, are plenty. That's what we're going to pray. In the chapel, I want you to pray it out with me. Richard, you lead them in this as we pray. In this main auditorium, I want us to pray this right now together. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. In your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Coleman's. God bless you, man. Love you guys. Love you. Well, I shared last night that for certain tonight I'm going to be preaching on the silence of God. And lo and behold, this morning, the Lord did a work in my heart, man. And so um, tomorrow night I'll be preaching on the silence of God. But... um. And it, it is, a, it's an interesting message that the Lord gave me the day before yesterday. No, yesterday. But I'd like to preach out of Acts chapter 11, verse 37. For those of you that are looking at your watch, you're wasting your time. Okay? If you've got, if you're just dead set on leaving, go ahead, man. I mean, you know, because here, it doesn't matter, Okay? And pastors, if you want revival in your church, you better accustom your church to that. And here's, here's one way that we've done it here. You have businessmen in your church that will burn the midnight oil to make a dollar. You can leave out of this church right now and drive down the streets and you see office buildings with lights on. Pull down there at 12 o'clock tonight. The lights are still on. That Mercedes is out front. That car is out there. What are they doing? They're getting a jump start, man, on tomorrow. There will be men on Sunday, men and women all over this nation on Sunday night at their offices burning the midnight oil, 12 o'clock at night. Why? To get a jump start on the world market. They'll do that. They'll substitute that for family, for food. They'll eat a hamburger instead of a home-cooked meal. Why? To make a dollar, friend. To make a buck. But the church, you know, we look at an hour or two and we go, dear God, that's all the time I got. Uh-uh. Not no more, friend. We need to burn the midnight oil for Jesus, man. I want to tell you, just say, Jesus, I'm here. Touch my life. And if you think this is a quick drive through friend, you're wrong, man. God's going to touch you, but we're not, we're not hasty. We're not in a hurry in this place. God could, God's going to touch your life, and you don't know when he's going to do it. So just stay tonight for the duration of it in the chapel. We will pray with every one of you there. God will touch you. Just everyone be patient tonight and listen to the word of the Lord. I am not a long-winded preacher. I'll preach for a few minutes tonight. Charity James is going to sing, Run to the Mercy Seat. Acts chapter 11. This is a passage I'm sure many of you pastors have preached. Chapter 2, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did I say 11? Whoa. I've got it written in Roman numerals here. I really do. Acts chapter 2. Verse 37. This came uh, right towards the closing of uh, Peter's sermon. Those of you that are familiar with this chapter, you know the baptism, the mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost had taken place, and Peter had preached a dynamic message. And uh, this was right towards the closing of it. He preached after this. If you'll read down, you'll see where he preached a little bit more. But verse 37, Acts chapter 2. Now when they heard this, this being the truth, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? 
I'd like to speak tonight for a few minutes on the arrows of the Lord. The arrows of the Lord. I want to tell you, friends, tonight God has got a bow and arrow. He's got a bow and arrow, and he's got it aimed at you, friend. I want to tell you something else about the Lord. He's a perfect shot. He can hit a moving target. He knows where you're going. You can hop in your car tonight and drive out of this place, and I want to tell you, you'll look out the window and that arrow's still flying towards you. He knows you're he knows where you're at, friends. God's got a bow and arrow. His arrows are sharp. Now, this is not the, 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 the thrust of the message tonight, but I want you to, in the scripture, in Psalm 45, 5, says his arrows are sharp. In Zechariah, Zechariah 9, 14, says they are, they, they are sent forth. They go forth like lightning, his arrows. And I love Psalm 38, 2, says they stick fast. We're talking about being pricked. In the heart. Listen to me, friends. This is what happened to these people. They were hit by the arrows of the Lord. To be pricked in the heart means to be pierced thoroughly. To means to agitate violently. Tonight, some of you are going to be agitated violently. I've watched you. I've preached in this place, friends, since Father's Day. I thank God for the opportunity to preach here. I thank God for this man right here that'll relinquish his pulpit night after night and let me preach in this revival. But I'll walk around this place, friends, and I'll look in some of your faces, and you are agitated. You are being agitated violently. I mean, that arrow's going, shoot, right in you, and you're jerking it around. You're trying to pull it out, but it's barbed, friend. I mean, it is in there. You're going, dear God, what's going on with me? It's, honey, let's get out of here. You can't get out of here, friend. Some of you have been nailed to that seat. The Holy Ghost has got a hold of you, man. Oh, I love this. I love this because it's not man's doing. It's the Spirit of the Lord. It's to agitate violently. Also, this word pricked means to sting. It means to sting. These people were pricked in their hearts. The arrows of the Lord flew from the mouth of Peter and found their way like guided missiles to the center of the listeners. And tonight, friend, if you will pay attention... If you will allow God a few minutes of your time, you're going to see something happen in your life. Those of you that are away from the Lord, there's some, a lot of backsliders here. I want to tell you, backslider, it's time to come home. All right? It's time to come home. We're winding up a millennium. Okay? Don't be a heathen in the year 2000, man. You know? You need to, you need to plan on it right now that you're going to celebrate that turning of a millennium. How many of you have ever celebrated a turning of a millennium? How about a century? We are going to be around for the turning, most of us, for the turning of a millennium. There's only been a few of those. And friend, do, do you, what do you want to be drunk somewhere for that? Ba backsliders, I want to tell you, it's time to come home tonight. Time to come home to Jesus. A few points about this scripture right here. First of all, who were these people that were pricked in their hearts by the arrows of the Lord? Who were they? Verse 5 says, They were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. They came together when they heard the mighty roar of Pentecost. They were amazed and they marveled. These people were Parthians and Medes and Elamites. This doesn't mean anything to most of you, I know it, but I'm going to go ahead and share it because there are theologians here that love this stuff. Okay? And so let it fly by for some of you. These people were Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Rome. They were Cretans and Arabs. They were all marveling at how God was speaking through, their, through these Galileans in their own language. I've got news for you, friends. Everyone here, God is still speaking your language. These folks were marveling that these other, these Galileans were speaking in tongues and they were hearing, they were hearing the, 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 the Lord about the Lord through their tongue. They were saying, how's this possible, man? This man's from Galilee and he's speaking my language. But I want to tell you, friend, it doesn't matter where you're from, God is still speaking your language. He understands you. It's amazing. We have a banker over here that got saved. Is that the truth, brother? You got saved in this revival, and we got punk rockers over here that got saved. He understands every language, friend. God will speak your language. 
It is amazing. It's amazing how in this altar service you can have a drug addict come to the Lord over here and a mom, a housewife that's been living away from God, raised in an upper-class family, just feels the Lord on her heart, comes up. Totally opposite, friends. The Lord is speaking. He's still speaking your language, friend. Who were these people, friends? They were folks just like you and me. Stay with me tonight. These people that were listening to Peter's sermon, these people that were pricked in their hearts by the arrows of the Lord, they were gathered there. I want you to imagine here a host from North and South Carolina, Baptists from Birmingham, Methodists from Miami, Pentecostals from Paducah, atheists from Atlanta, Mormons from Mississippi, Catholics from California, drug addicts from W Street, the sick from Sacred Heart, ex-cons from Draper, pastors, Sunday school teachers, lawyers, doctors, bums, vacuum cleaner salesmen. I'm trying... And that's not saying a vacuum cleaner salesman is a bum. But if you don't sell enough vacuum cleaners, you will be a bum. Honor roll students, media mongols, I'm talking about the people that are hanging around this message tonight. The folks that were hanging around Peter's preaching, friends, were normal people. They were normal people, friend. Media mongols, newspaper delivery boys, butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers, red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. Every one of the listeners in Acts chapter 2 were in the right place at the right time under divine appointment. Everyone here in this house is in the right place and in the chapel at the right time. And if you're listening from your home, I want to tell you, friend, this ain't a movie. All right? This is not a movie. This is God coming into your living room. This is the Lord coming into your living room, friend. And if you think you just flipped it on, you can flip it off, try it. I want to tell you what's going to happen. Because God's got something for you if you'll stay on the air with us. But if you flip it, all you're going to hear, you're going to be watching some Western tonight. And all you're going to hear is this preacher saying, God has something for you. God has something for you. God has. And you're going to flip back to me to see what I'm saying. I know you are. Every time there's a commercial, you'll run back to see what the preacher's saying. Why don't you save yourself all that energy and just stay with me? But this morning, the Lord took me from this group of people. I was, I was thinking about all these folks. You know, the Bible says they're from all these different countries. And I, people ask me all the time, what's it like preaching at the Brownsville Revival? You know, folks coming in from all over. There's times we have 5,000 people here. This place only holds 2,300. You know, and they're just everywhere. It's like ants. I remember one time I went out the back, and it wasn't a break. It wasn't a break time. Everybody, the service was going. I went in the back. There must have been 300 people in the hallway back there. And I look at all these people from all walks of life, and folks have asked me, what's it like? They've asked John Kilpatrick, what's it like having all these people pouring through your church? You want to know something? All we see is one person. I see one person. I'm preaching tonight to one person. I'm preaching to you, brother. I'm preaching to you, sir. I'm preaching to you, ma'am. I see one person out here tonight, and the Lord showed me this morning that in this group of people, they were made up of individuals out there, and every one of them were at a different place in their life. And the arrows of the Lord were heading towards that bullseye, friend. The Lord had a plan, and I want to share with you a couple people that were standing there. This is hypothetical. But this is an example of the people that were sitting there listening to Peter. There was 18-year-old David. Listen to me, friends. This may be you. There was 18-year-old David who had been listening to his older brother Samuel continually talk negative about Jesus Christ. He was standing there on that day that Pentecost came down. David was standing there, and he had been listening to Samuel, his older brother, constantly degrade the name of Jesus Christ. They had both been at the crucifixion. David had slipped away from Samuel and had worked his way close to the cross. He looked at the base of the beam and saw soldiers in total disregard, in disrespect, gambling for his garments. Their indifferent, disgusted young David. Then he looked around at the foot of the cross. The ground was, filled, was, was spotted with drops of blood. His eyes focused on the feet of our Lord. There he saw rough-headed steel nails piercing this man's flesh 
Blood was splurting out, running over his toes, creating a steady stream down the base of the cross. His eyes continued upward as he looked at this man hanging on this tree. This man's body was trembling under the sheer agony, the shock of crucifixion. One look at his midsection caused a rush of embarrassment to flood over David's soul. This man was naked. He was hanging, bleeding, and dying, totally nude, in total humiliation. David turned his eyes from the Lord's body in total shame, as he did. I'm talking, friends, about the people that were hanging around on the day of Pentecost that were listening to Peter. When you read this, friends, they're not just this man and this man from here and from there. These are people, friends, that God had been preparing he and he has been preparing you, friend, for this time tonight. This is a divine appointment with the Lord, and it was a divine appointment for David. He turned his eyes from the Lord's nude body in total shame. As he did, he caught the eyes of others watching him die. They were mumbling and grumbling things like, Hey, if you're the Christ, jump off that cross. Save yourself. You saved others. Look at him. He can't even save himself. David turned from him. He was startled at the contrast between those men and the man on the cross. He glanced back at Jesus. His eyes focused on his hands. They were rough. They were callous. They were men's hands. They were covered in blood. As he stared at the Lord's hands, his eyes caught a glimpse of the man on the left and the man on the right. They were men just like this man, but seemed to be dying differently. The man in the middle seemed so innocent, so guiltless. About that time, David, who was 18 years of age, he just happened to be there with his brother Samuel to watch a bloody crucifixion. At that time, he was snapped to attention by something this man said. David was now close enough to hear the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. These words pierced young David like an arrow. He buckled over in pain. He hurt deep down inside. He began backing away from the cross. He tripped over some onlookers who were sitting on the ground watching Jesus die. They blurted out, watch where you're going, stupid boy. To them, it was a cutting command, an insult to young David. They cursed him, and David said, hey, sorry, man. Sorry, I wasn't looking where I was going, and David continued backing up. As he continued stumbling, their words, which were meant for bad, stay with me, friends, began to churn in his heart. Watch where you're going, stupid boy. Watch where you're going, stupid boy. David began to cry. Where am I going? What if that was me hanging on the cross? Where would I spend eternity? Where am I going? What did that man mean when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? Who was he talking to? Was he really communicating with God? Young David joined his older brother, Samuel, and he blurted out. Samuel said to David, let's get out of here. It's almost over anyway. The show's almost gone. See, David, I told you, Jesus was just a man. David was one of those people that Peter was preaching to. Stay with me, friends. God knows how to prepare the heart for the message and the message for the heart. Who else was there listening to that thundering Holy Ghost-filled preacher? There stood Elizabeth. Listen to this, friends, because God has been preparing some of you. There stood Elizabeth with her little daughter, Ruth. They had been first-hand witnesses to mighty, a mighty miracle just a few months earlier. They had seen a blind beggar man open his eyes. 
Elizabeth and her little daughter Ruth had seen it with their own eyes. The very man that little Ruth had given a small coin to just a day earlier was now walking the streets with full vision. The miracle had shaken their spiritual foundation. It was a topic of conversation for days on end around the dinner table. Little Ruth, being only eight years of age, has caused the family great confusion by asking mom and dad a very pointed question. Parents, I want to tell you, kids are like that. They can point you, they can nail you in a heartbreak, Papa. Kids will look at you, Dad, and say, Daddy, would Jesus do that? Daddy, would Jesus be like that? Would Jesus holler at mama like that, daddy? Kids are incredible for transmitting truth. Little Ruth turns to mom and dad with this pointed question. How is it possible, mommy? How is it po possible, daddy? How can a man open the eyes of another blind man if God is not with him? Her dad hung his head and said, baby, I don't know. I can't understand it, but there must be an explanation. Jeremiah, our good neighbor, is an educated man. He's a strong leader in the church. He said it was some type of sorcery. But I don't know, Ruthie. I just don't know. Those are some of the people that were hanging around that day, friend, when Peter started to preach. There were others who had never heard the whole story of Jesus, but were attracted by the size of the crowd. They got close, too close for comfort, and were nailed by the arrows of the Lord. That's who was there, friends. I just want to personalize it for you. Would you allow me to do that? Who's in this place tonight? Teachers, lawyers. There's doctors here. There's there's garbage men here. There are students here in this place. There are professional athletes here tonight. In the chapel, in the chapel we have waitresses. We have moms and dads by the scores. We have executives from local businesses. And we have some that have flown in from across the country to be here tonight. Every one of you are like the ones that were standing there before Peter that day. Every one of us have been prepared by the Lord. We have been brought to this place. I tell you, friend, I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe that things just sort of happen. I believe that was divine appointment for you guys. And I believe tonight was a divine appointment, this marriage. How many believe that? I want to tell you, I want to tell you who was standing at attention. Millions. Of demons and devils and I'm talking man I guarantee you that Satan sent cohorts out there to get in touch with witches and warlocks I mean they, this is one thing he cannot stand is marriages coming back together if he can destroy a family friend if he can destroy a family I can guarantee he's going what on earth I thought I told you guys to stop that marriage you don't you think they're taking this sitting down they ain't taking it sitting down, friend. You want to know why? They got three children. They got three kids. Did you know what just happened? They were all just sucked right back into the kingdom of God, just like that. Whoa! Just like that. And I can see the devil going, I had a plan for that little boy. What's your son's name? Jacob? JT. I can hear Satan say, I had plans for JT, man. I was going to make him bitter. I was going to fill him with hate. He was, going to, he was going to be out there. He was going to be one of our salesmen, man. He was going to get out here and destroy people with all the bitterness and hatred. He was going to be a drug addict. He was going to be a dealer. He was going to bring thousands of people down because of what happened in that marriage. Now look at him. He's probably going to be a preacher. Yes. What caused these people to be pricked in their hearts? We know who they were now, and I want you to understand, friends, that they're human beings just like you and I. David's standing there, Elizabeth and Ruthie's standing there. Listen to this preacher preach. 
What caused these people to be pricked in their hearts by the arrows of the Lord? The first thing, don't you miss this, was the zeal of an on-fire, blood-washed, heaven-sent, uncompromising, sold-out, known-in-hell, Holy Ghost preacher. The zeal of the Lord had consumed Peter. The word of God was like a fire shut up inside his bones. Preachers, you know what I'm talking about, man. You can't keep your mouth shut. I love Holy Ghost preachers. I highly respect a man of God who will stand behind a pulpit, whether it be hardened oak or see-through acrylic, and preach the whole counsel of God. The Bible says... How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That's what the Bible says. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Preachers, I want you to stand up. Every pastor, every evangelist, every minister in this congregation up in the balcony, down here in the chapel, stand up. Every person, if you're a youth pastor, minister of music, if you're in the ministry, I want you to stand up. A word about the preacher. We have all learned that bold and haughty men turn to the preacher during their hour of anguish and terror, haven't we? While the wine is flowing, listen up everybody, while the wine is flowing freely, while the party is in full swing, while the money is being tossed about with no concern for tomorrow, while this is all going on, nobody cares about the preacher. God is scorned and ridiculed. The name of his son Jesus Christ is called upon only in cursings and revelings. Sin is being savored. The heathen are fast dancing with the devil. Mockery of right living in Christianity is at an all-time high. The sinners laughingly cry out, Eat! Drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. They belch out vile utterances from hell. Grab for the bottle, guzzle down more poison, and continue on in their heathenistic debauchery. But when the party's over, when the wine bottle is empty, when the lover has left the bed, when they're laying flat on their back in the hospital room, suffering from the consequences of drinking and driving, or maybe all bloated with cirrhosis of the liver, guess who they call? They call the preacher. God bless the preacher man. God bless the Holy Ghost preachers. God bless you, man. I've witnessed it for years. Remain standing, preachers. I've seen it for years, man. I have seen the agnostics, the stoics, the God-haters. I've had them cuss me out. I've had them scream at me. I've, told, I've, I've had it all, friend. I've had beer thrown in my face. But the very people that do all of that, when it comes a day of suffering, when something's going on, guess who they turn to? The preacher. Why? They know you love them, man. They know you care about them. You're sent from God. And they know that. And I want you to remember this tonight, friend. No matter what you're facing, you are called of the Lord. And there is a great awakening coming to this country, and you are going to be like a man standing beside a tractor trailer rig, and you're going to be handing out food to the hungry. They're going to come to you from everywhere. They're starving. They're dying. They're thirsty, preacher man. And you're going to feed them the word. You're going to give them food, man. They're going to come to you. God is sending a famine in the land. He is sending a famine. Atlanta will never be the same. When this revival, when God's finished, when he finishes, man, I don't want to tell you, friend. Don't worry about a thing. <laughs> just, I, we just don't even try to keep up with God. Just float in the river. God, wherever you're going, I'm going. Whatever you're doing, I'm doing, Jesus. Some of you are going to experience this, pastors, after we pray with you. You're going to go back to your pulpits. Listen in the chapel. You're going to go back to your pulpits. And you're going to have the word. You're going to prepare messages like you always have. But there's going to be an unction. 
I'm talking about a fresh unction come over you and it's going to be smoking inside of you. You're going to be burning white hot inside and you're going to go, dear God, dear God. And that zeal is going to consume them, man. God bless you. You may be seated. 